So let's see if I can get this to work. Okay. So uh, so now, uh, so I have this escape rate. I can talk about the uh, density, which is gonna be, we'll see it's a probability density of a trajectory. So in order to talk about this, we need to fix an initial probability distribution on the set of vertices. What's a probability distribution? It's just a function to the non-negative real numbers whose uh, sum over all vertices, if we add up all the values of the function, we get one. Okay, so that's all it is. Um, and if gamma naught is infinite, we're gonna get uh, an infinite series. We have to worry about what that means, uh, but let's ignore that for now. Let's assume just gamma naught is finite. Okay, so now let's define a function from the set of trajectories of uh, length n and duration t to the non-negative real numbers. What do we do? So we're gonna take it to, uh, so its value at a trajectory is you take the, uh, you take the initial vertex of the trajectory, the starting point, evaluate the initial probability distribution Q on it, that's Q, Q, sub, Q sub I sub one, multiply by the escape rate at I sub one on the time interval from zero to T one, then multiply by the first edge of your trajectory at the, at the time T one, then multiply by the escape rate at I two, then multiply, you're gonna keep alternating, multiplying by escape rates, then edge rates until you get to the end. So here's what you get. And this, I'll depict this formula in a moment in a picture, but this is what you get. You take the product of all the uh, escape rates that appear on the trajectory uh, using the subdivision points in your, uh, in your, in your trajectory. Uh, I mean, because a trajectory is just a subdivision of the, of the interval from zero to T. And just multiply them all together. And then you multiply all the edge rates together at, the, at these times that appear uh, in the subdivision. Okay, so that's what it is. And let me show you a picture. So you're starting off at the initial distribution Q sub I one, then you're multiplying it by the, the escape rate at that edge. Then you're multiplying it by the, uh, the, the edge rate at T1. Then you're multiplying it by the escape rate at I2 from T1 to T2. Then you're multiplying it by the edge rate uh, along alpha two at T2. Then you're multiplying it by the escape rate and so on till you get to the end. So that's what you get. Any questions about this? It seems mysterious, but when we state and prove our main theorem, it'll be less mysterious what this all means, maybe. Okay. So here are the results. So uh, I'm gonna first talk about the main result, which it really doesn't appear in the literature anywhere. And that's why we wrote this paper that I'm gonna reference at the end. Uh, I've never really seen it mentioned anywhere except in the constant rate case in physics papers, but I've never seen it in a math textbook, which is surprising to me. So consider this master equation, but I make it into an initial value problem. The initial probability, the initial distribution is the probability distribution Q that I, that I fix once and for all. So now I have an initial value problem. I have a matrix differential equation. This is something that we cover, by the way, at least in dimensions two and three in our 2150 course. So it's not mysterious. So the theorem, which I'll call sum over history, sum over all histories, the formal solution to the initial value problem is the vector valued function P of T, uh, because that's what really these distributions are. They're vector valued functions where the components are the vertices of my graph uh, is given by this expression. So what does this expression mean? It's, a, it's an iterated integral, a multiple integral, where the integrand is this density function I've described. 
f uh, applied to a trajectory where the trajectory is assumed uh, to have the property that its terminus is i. It's, it's last, the last vertex of the trajectory is i. So that's going to be the ith component of my vector valued function. And then I, I integrate away all the times that occur, all the jump times. I integrate them away. And what's left is t, the number t that appears. That's not, that doesn't disappear when I integrate. So I have a t left over. And then I'm going to sum up over all trajectories, over all paths of length, of length n that can occur in such a trajectory. And then I sum up over all n to give me all paths. So I'm summing over all paths, if you like, that end in the vertex i, and I'm waiting the I'm waiting the uh, I'm waiting the sum by this density function f, right? So uh, so this is like uh, this is what I'm doing, um, and this kind of thing is very familiar to physicists. It's not really as familiar to mathematicians. Uh, pure mathematicians, this kind of uh, like that the solution should look like this, I guess, but this is the way it looks. I'm going to give a proof, a complete proof of this on the next slides. But before I, I move on, are there any questions about the statement? Is it clear? Okay. So, um, Here's the proof, and I learned this from Vladimir, how, how this is done. The proof uses, uh, it's a baby version of what a physicist might call perturbation theory. So we write the master operator as a sum of two matrices. A0 is the diagonal matrix with entries HII. And then, uh, and then the remaining matrix A sub one is everything else. So that's a, that's a matrix which has zeros along the diagonal. Um, and so it's got hij when i is not equal to j in it. But then we modify the master operator by an epsilon, where we take a0 plus epsilon times a1. We get a new operator, h sub epsilon. And then we have a new equation, p prime of t equals h epsilon p of t, where p of 0 is the initial distribution q. OK, so that, and then what we're going to do is, we're going to try to solve this, and then at the end of the day, we'll set epsilon equal to one, because when epsilon equals one, you get the the, equa the original equation. So we're looking for a formal solution now. Uh, p zero plus epsilon p one plus epsilon squared p two. When I write p one, p two, etc., these are not powers; these are indices. I'm using superscripts for indices. Epsilon superscript two means epsilon squared, right? So the notation is a bit awkward because I need to also have subscripts as well. And then that's why I'm using uh, superscripts here. The subscripts are gonna appear in the proof. So P upper two means not P squared, but it's an indexing parameter for the coefficient of epsilon squared. OK, and I want P0, so I want a formal solution. That's a power series in epsilon with the property that P upper 0 of 0 is the initial distribution Q, and then P upper N of 0 is 0 for N bigger than 0, because I want to satisfy the initial condition. OK, so that's step one. You do that. You play this trick, right? Once a solution is found, we're gonna set epsilon equal, one, equal to one to get the formal solution to the master equation. When I say formal solution, I mean, I don't worry about convergence of the power series at this point. Uh, you know, that's what a formal solution is. Okay, so let's expand both sides of this modified equation in epsilon, uh, where I stick in P, I'm assuming that the formal solution has this form. I stick it into both sides, I differentiate this P which has an epsilon in it, uh, and I get a power series on the left, and then I apply the matrix on the right to P of T, uh, our candidate for P, and then I get an equation in epsilon, and then I equate the, equa the coefficients of epsilon to the power of N on each side. And you can do this yourself. What you get is a linear system uh, for each N, that's uh, the nth coefficient, 
p dot n, which means the time derivative of p n uh, is equal to a zero p n plus a one p n minus one. You can just check that yourself. It's very easy to check. So it's just writing out the equation. I'm, I'm using the convention here that p minus one equals zero here because when n equals uh, zero, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the equation is p dot n equals a zero p n. So for i of vertex, the ith equation of the system, now this is a system here that I've displayed uh, up here. This is, this is actually a system still. It's still a matrix system. Uh, it actually, I can look at what it looks like on each row of the system. I mean, you're gonna write out the system as, as a row of equations. So I have to tell you what the i row looks like. And uh, here it is. This is a linear differential equation. I'm converting the system to a system of linear, a list of linear differential equations of the, of the first order, where the uh, first derivative term is on the left and the zeroth derivative term is the first term on the right. And then the last term is the uh, non-homogeneous non part of the equation, right? So this is something that you would show your students in 2150, but it doesn't, it's not as complicated looking it is, but this is not very complicated at all, right? This is fairly standard. Now, what do we teach our students when we have a first order linear differential equation? We have methods for solving every first order linear differential equation. So when n equals zero, the system is actually uncoupled meaning that it's the, the last term, the summation that appears there is not there at all because it involves P minus one and P minus one is zero. So we're gonna get P dot N equals H I I P P N, you know, in, 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 in row I. So you can separate, separation of variables works here. You can get the, the equation is separable. You can integrate. And you can see that the, the answer just looks like uh, when n equals zero, p uh, zero sub i is uh, the initial value qi, because we have to satisfy the initial value problem, uh, the exponential from zero to t of the rate hii integrated. Okay, so that's what, what happens when n equals zero. And this can be rewritten, of course, by uh, my definition as qi times U I zero T, right? That's what it is. Okay. And so that's what that's what it is. Okay, so that's when n equals zero. What about when n is greater than zero? We can go back to this equation here. When n is bigger than zero, we can use the integrating factor method, right? Where we uh, uh, to solve this equation. And if I do it, uh, I can solve the uh, the ODE by iterating for, by using the integrating factor. So if I do it once, if I apply the iterating factor once, I get PI N of T. So you have to like write it out and you'll see that, you know, the integrating factor is usually called mu in the textbooks. So you have to integrate the exponential of mu DT. That's your, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You have to, I'm sorry, not, that's not true. The integrating factor is the integral that appears, it's e to the power of t, uh, to the integral of tn to t of this integral that appears inside the integrand uh, of, of what I've written here. That's the integrating factor that appears um, uh, where, um, well, I'm saying too much. This is what the integrating factor gives you when you actually solve the equation. But you can rewrite this. You can rewrite it in the following way. So the first term in the integrand that appears is uh, an exit rate. And then, uh, your, uh, then you get uh, an ed edge rates that appear. It's a sum over all edges because i and j index all the uh, edges from i to j. So it's a sum over all edges. That's where that summation comes from. And then we have we can think of J as being the last edge of a trajectory that we're going to construct. So that's in blue. Look at that blue term. That blue term is just like the thing we just solved, PIN, except that N has been replaced by N minus one. 
So what I could do is apply the integrating factor method again to the blue term and then stick it into the integrand. So if I do that, this, uh, so by the way, the second sum is over all edges alpha n with terminus i, which is i n plus one, and that's just notation, whose source is denoted in the integrand by i n. So that's what this means. This is just notation. And then we can take the blue term and apply the same method to it. That is, you uh, solve for it using the uh, using the integrating factor. So if I do that, I get another. A, I get an, I get the single integral I get becomes replaced by a double integral, and this is what you get. And you start seeing something which appears like the density function f. It's the first two terms that you would get in your density function f that I wrote down before. Now we have this red term to deal with. We can iterate again. Uh, by the way, this last sum is indexed over all paths of length two, such that the path goes from i sub n minus one to i sub n to i sub n plus one. Those are the vertices of the path. And the last vertex of that path is i. Okay, so now iterating n times if the path has length n results in the desired expression that you were looking for for, for Pn of t. And then uh, you can just sum up overall n to get the final answer. So that's the proof of the main theorem of the, of the, the first theorem. Okay, so that's why, uh, let me go back to the statement. That's why you get what you get here. It's just applying the, the integrating factor method and using some notation and rewriting sums and all that, right? That's all it is. There's nothing deep in this. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So, so now let me introduce some notation. Let T gamma T be the set of all trajectories of any length of duration T. And let P of T be the formal solution to the master equation with P of zero equals Q, a probability distribution. So uh, I want to state a corollary, which is sort of a theorem too. For T, every T, fixed T bigger than zero, we have that the formal solution converges. P of T is a probability distribution on gamma zero for every time T. For, this is for fixed T. And the function, which is our density is actually a probability density, means that, that it actually is, is integrates to one, right? It's, it's, it satisfies the axioms of probability. It's a P, probability density function in the sense of 5,700, math 5,700. Okay, and it's a probability density on the, on the space of trajectories. Okay, so the integral of over the entire space of trajectories is one, and, and that's, all, that's what it means to be a probability density. Okay, so here's the proof of one, two, and three. By the rate bound, there is a constant C independent of N such that, remember F is a product of certain rates that appear. And, uh, and for, if the tra trajectory has length N, there's gonna, the rate bound guarantees that the, uh, that the density is, uh, is bounded above by some, C to the power of N for some constant C. And by the degree bound, the number of paths of length n with terminus i, the number of paths that can appear in your graph is at most d to the n, right? That's easy to check also, that the number of paths you can possibly get is d to the n because at every vertex you have uh, at, most, at most say uh, d edges, right? Uh, leaving, your, leaving, uh, uh, leaving your vertex, right? So uh, there is going to be d to d, and then when you go again to your next vertex, there's going to be at most d, and it just multiplies. Okay, so so you're going to get these two bounds, the number of paths of length n, and for the density, and then you can use it to bound your integrand uh, that appears. I mean, the sum that appears in the theorem. 
but on one on the one side it's bounded above but bounded below by zero because the density is non-negative. On the other side, it's bounded by uh, CD times T to the n over n factorial, where the sum ranges over all paths of length n with terminus i. Now I've used the fact here is that uh, is that a simplex based on zero to t. So if you look at the set of numbers t1 through tn that's sandwiched in between zero and t, um, I'm missing an inequality sign before tn. That's a simplex. That's a standard simplex based on uh, an interval of length zero t. That has volume t to the n over n factorial. We do that when, for a three simplex. Uh, in uh, math 2030, we, our students do that in math 2030, where they calculate the volume of a simplex. So it's easy to calculate the volume of a simplex. It's t to the n over n factorial. That's all it is. So I've used that here because uh, if you sort of, if f wasn't there, if the f wasn't there, you would have a one in the integrand and that would be the volume of a simplex. But f is there, so you bound f by c to the n times d to the n, and this gives you that, that statement. But now by the comparison test, uh, the series P sub n sub i, P n i t converges, right? Uh, therefore, uh, also we can sum over all, uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a convergent series of, of numbers, but that implies the convergent series of vectors also converges. I'm just using the comparison test, the usual comparison, math 2020 in that case, right? That's all it is because the series, uh, you know, e to the t converges. That's all, I mean, the series for e to the t converges. Okay, so, uh, so I've just used, that's all I've used here. Okay, that proves one. What about two? What was two saying? Two says I have a probability distribution for p of t for each t at each time t. How do you prove that? Well, uh, let one be the row vector. We can think of it as a row vector, which is just a function which is identically one at every vertex. Okay, so here I guess I'm assuming that there are finitely many vertices. Okay, so that to make sense of this, so I have a row vector. Um, no, this makes sense in general. It could be an infinite, it's just a row vector. Okay, so gamma naught could be infinite. Uh, it will suffice to show that the dot product of, of one with P of T equals one, because what is one dot P of T? It's the sum of, entry of the components of P of T. So how do I do that? Well, first of all, observe that one dot H, the, the master operator is zero, identically zero, since the entries of H in any column add to zero, right? So that's what it means for the sum of the entries in every column of h uh, add to zero. So now take the derivative of one dot p of t. I'm taking the dot product or the scalar product, some people call it. Well, you know, there's a formula from, from vector calculus. You learn that this is given by one dot p prime of t because one is a constant function, vector valued function, but P prime of T satisfies is part of the master equation. That's H times P of T because P of T is the is the the solution to the master equation. We now know it's not only a formal solution; it's actually a solution. But but one dot H is zero, so you get zero. Therefore, what do we know? One dot P of T, the function one dot P of T, is constant. But we also know that one dot P of zero is one because of our assumptions that P of zero, which is the initial distribution Q is a probability distribution. So if one dot P of T is constant, one dot P of T must be one for all T. So I've just showed you, uh, this is the proof of two. And three immediately follows from two, if you think about it, I won't say much about it. Uh, question, part three said, that, uh, that F is a probability density. That's obvious now from, from part two. Okay, so we've just proved part three. Okay, so now this is the last part of my talk. Um, it's gonna take maybe five minutes more. Uh, I wanna talk about fundamental solutions, uh, which uh, is just, uh, it's really not, there are no theorems here. It's just sort of a way of rewriting things. 
let's consider the master equation in the special case where you have an initial distribution, which is given by a delta function. What delta function? So you fix a vertex i once and for all, and delta i of j is the Kronecker delta function. That is, it vanishes unless i equals j, and when i equals j, it's one. The solution to this particular equation, this master equation with this initial condition is called a fundamental solution and it will be denoted by different notation. It will be called U I comma T. Okay. In this case, the density F, because uh, the initial distribution starts at vertex I and there's no other, you're not starting anywhere else, the density is supported on the set of trajectories with initial vertex i. You don't have to look at the set of trajectories starting anywhere else, right? So, so, so we look at just the trajectories that, that start with initial vertex i. Okay, so f was originally, the density function f was originally defined on the larger set of trajectories starting anywhere. But now we're looking at, we, don't, we can, it suffices to consider the density starting on trajectories which start at vertex i. And corollary, the corollary to the theorem is that uh, with respect to this assumption, the function is a probability density on that. This is trivial, it just follows from nothing, right? I just wanna point out why do you care about fundamental solutions? Well, because of the superposition principle, which is also something we cover in math 2150, the general solution to the master equation with initial condition p of zero equals q is contained from the fun, is con obtained from the fundamental solutions by taking the linear combination of the fundamental solutions weighted by the components of the initial distribution q. This is completely obvious. Okay, so that's the su superposition principle which we teach our students. Okay, I wanna talk about the propagator. So uh, also known as an integral kernel, if you like. Uh, physicists might call this a propagator, mathematicians might call this a kernel. So let's set k i j t equal to the u sub j of i t. So that is the probability of the set of trajectories of duration t, which start at vertex i and terminate at vertex j. Okay, so we start at vertex i and we terminate at j. And we wanna know the probability of the set of tra trajectories of duration t, which, have the, which start at i and end at j. So let's rename things a little bit uh, to make it look more like a physicist would write it. So uh, let's rename a vertex i by x. And let's look at the i x component of the solution to the master equation. And let's define at time t. So let's define that as psi x comma t. Okay, so, you know, uh, like a wave function or whatever you want to call it, right? A distribution. Okay, so this is, uh, so then the superposition, if you rewrite the superposition principle, you can rewrite it as saying psi y comma t is a sum over all vertices. Uh, apply the propagator to psi x zero, which you could think of if you thought of, uh, I mean, you wouldn't write it this way typically because it's a discrete set gamma naught. You can think of it as the integral of the propagator applied to psi. So this is like what you call an integral kernel in, in uh, functional analysis, if you like, okay? But it propagates. If you know sort of the value of psi at x comma zero, you know what it is at, at, at y comma uh, you know the value of psi at x zero, you know what it is at y comma t. Um, so it's sort of, a, uh, it's, uh, so it, it tells you the evolution of the, of the, uh, of the distribution psi x zero. Uh, so uh, by the theorem, we can rewrite this, this uh, propagator in this particular way. The only thing new here is that you're summing up overall paths of length n from x to y, right? Rather than paths which just terminate at y. And because that's because we started off, we we're looking at fundamental solutions. Okay, so that's, that's that. And then one more thing, uh, here's an example, the heat kernel. So uh, if we have an R, let's consider an R regular graph. 
so that means the number of edges meeting each vertex is R. And this is not, this is, an, this X is an undirected graph. Assume the rates are all constant with value one. Then the master operator is, I said this before, is the graph Laplacian. And in this case, you can actually directly compute the density function. It's easy to compute. It's this, uh, this Kronecker delta function, uh, delta sub i. Uh, why did I write this? Oh yeah, well, because I'm looking at the initial, I'm looking at the, the, um, the, the, I'm looking at the fundamental solution here. And in this case, we, F alpha T is given by E to the minus RT. So uh, multiply by this Delta I. So let's consider uh, the, uh, let's consider the following function. So let's consider the number of paths from I to J of length N in gamma. That's a finite number. And let's divide by, uh, the number of paths which start at the vertex i. So this is like a conditional probability. Given that you're starting at i, let's look at the probability of ending at j, starting at i, right? And that's what you get, right, for a path, right? And this is, in, I'm looking at paths now, not trajectories, right? So this, this is the number of paths of length n and gamma, uh, uh, divided by r to the n. So then uh, here's an exercise. Compute the, uh, compute the propagator in this case. And the propagator is given by this function p, phi sub n i j times p of n. And what is p of n? This is the Poisson uh, probability mass function with parameter lambda equals r t. Right, so the Poisson distribution is something we teach our undergraduates in 5700. In fact, we teach it even at the 2000 level, I believe. And so, uh, a someone who's an expert in Mar Mar like, if you go to like these classical books on Markov on probability theory, uh, like Feller, Feller would say this is our, expresses our continuous time random walk as a discrete time random walk subordinated to a Poisson process. So that's, the, that's what they would say here. Anyway, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, by the way, in this case, K that we've just computed or the exercise is claiming is called the combinatorial heat kernel. And the path integral representation is a combinatorial analog of the Wiener path integral. So um, I think that's it for today. Um, but uh, I, uh, I would just like to reference the paper we put up on the archive, which has all the, you know, in detail, all the, everything I've shown you today. The only thing that I've shown you today that's different is I've added more pictures to it and I've shortened some of the exposition. So uh, are there any questions? No questions? Yes, Vladimir. Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't have questions. Okay. Nice, nice talk, John. You're welcome. So my plan, uh, my plan is to, uh, is to continue with various topics from week to week. Um, and to try to introduce topics that don't require very much in the way of preparation to talk about to a general graduate student audience, but they're at the research level, right? So, uh, so that is, it's not, the stuff is not necessarily in the literature, for example, or only recently entered the literature, right, for example. Um, and so that's a tall order. But if anybody else, including faculty, uh, is interested in giving a talk at this seminar, I would welcome it. Um, next week, I plan to talk about uh, the Kirchhoff uh, spanning tree theorem and uh, a generalization that's due to my collaborators uh, and myself. 
uh, and uh, it'll be uh, at more or less the same level, maybe a little high, slightly higher level, but still within the range of the graduate student population here, I hope. So um, are, are there any comments of any kind, not you know, that would anything, uh, anything I could do better in some way that, you know, feedback would be good too. That was a really good overview. Um, you know, electrical engineers and, and counter Markov chains and communications theory. And this was a, quite a refreshing uh, exposition of it. Uh, I didn't, I've never seen it like this before. So thank you. Yeah, I don't think you'll find any of this like described in this way in the textbooks. I because I, I actually search most, at least the math textbooks. They don't have a treatment like this at all. So that was like kind of the main reason I had to do this. For my, we did it for ourselves. I wanted to. I didn't really understand the exposition in the textbooks very much. It's not very well motivated in a way from a top, topologist's point of view. So that's my. Uh, for what it's worth. And uh, I hope I did not uh, insult Vladimir by giving this talk. <laughs> so. well, well, why should they, should they be insulted? Look, John, I have a comment. It's really, it was really a very nice talk. And I think, I think it's, uh, you know, it's probably the best, you know, uh, way to present this material to mathematicians because, you know, the way, the way, the way how, uh, probability theorists, you know, present those things, uh, you know, to me, it's, 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 it's hard to comprehend. It's kind of like you can talk about an extremely simple thing using this probability uh, theory of language, and it becomes extremely complicated. Right. So what I, I didn't use that, I don't think I used the words in my talk, but what we're really doing here is we're explaining why a continuous time Markov chain is what is called a stochastic process. And what is a stochastic process? A stochastic process is nothing more, although you, could find, you won't find this anywhere in the literature, it's nothing more than a probability distribution on the sp space of trajectories. That's what a stochastic process is, a probability distribution on the space of, dis uh, of, of, of trajectories. That's not usually how it's represented in the math literature, but that's what it is, right? So, um, so uh, and I learned that also from Vladimir. Yeah, I can confirm it's not in Carlin and Taylor's two volumes set on yeah, stochastic yeah. processes. Yeah, so, so I'm trying to motivate this from things I know, uh, not from, and you know, I'm not very good at reading what other people write. I often have, and I think this is actually good for graduate students, what I'm gonna say. Often you read something in a math textbook and it just seems like, like I, I don't understand what the author is driving at. Sometimes you have to grapple it with yourself and turn it into something else that you do understand from some other place. And that's really what I, how I actually proceed with almost everything I do. That's good advice. It's, it's yeah. very good advice. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, John, 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 can I make like another comment? Sure. I think I think in uh, one of the important things uh, you presented here is uh, that if you replace, for example, uh, a uh, stochastic differential equation on some manifold, mm -hmm. you replace it with you know this finite uh, dimensional version. When, for example, you like create a triangulation, right? And instead, and instead of this like Kolmogorov equation uh, for a random process, or what people or what people call uh, uh, the Fokker-Planck equation in physics, then the discrete version would be this master equation. That's right. Uh, and then, like the the the, the, the this measure. Uh, uh, the, the, this measure uh, in the space of trajectories that you presented and you uh, claimed, uh, claimed it explicitly uh, is the, the discrete analog of the Wiener measure. That's right. But you see, nice thing is uh, that this discrete analog, this measure is extremely simple. Yes, so and that's, it, that, that's why you could actually even present it to graduate students, right? I mean, that's the- So, uh, so, so it, 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 it's very nice, I mean, to, to understand, you know, what, what you know, the Wiener measure 
means. Yeah, yeah. So, so what Vladimir is saying, let's just take a simple case. Suppose you have a, a surface, like say you have a torus, right? Uh, mo many of you realize that you can triangulate a surface, right? You can, you can actually tile it with triangles, right? So that gives you um, a way of uh, that. That actually or, 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 uh, gives you a way of turning something that's a continuum, something that's continuous, that is the surface, into something that's combinatorial, right? And uh, now the uh, I, I, I kind of mentioned that what we're doing here is a toy version of something you would like to do sort of in a continuous way. That's what these Markov chains are. They're like a toy model for something that you would like to do in a continuous way, right? Unfortunately, when you try to do this in a continuous way, try to describe the, the dynamics uh, in this continuum uh, on the on the continuous in the continuous setting, you end up with all sorts of technical issues that you have to resolve, and it's much more complicated. Um, however, when you turn the problem into a toy problem, things become very elementary. All the problems disappear pretty much, right? That's what, that's what this kind of, you know, yet it does contain in its essence many of the, much of the flavor in terms of the, the final results of the continuous theory. So, um, so what is the continuous theory? The state space in the continuous theory is no longer a graph or what might be something higher dimensional than a graph, like a finite simplicial complex, right? In the continuous theory, you want to replace this sort of combinatorial thing, the state, state diagram, with a, a manifold, a, a, like in this case, a torus maybe, right? And then do, do this, write down your equations as equations on the manifold. Uh, and, and Vladimir mentioned one more thing, is that there are basically two ways of studying these dynamics. I didn't really touch upon uh, directly uh, the, the other approach, but it's sort of embedded in writing down the theorem, which is that um, you, know, you have this master equation. That's an equation that acts not on distributions, right? On, 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 on probability distributions. It tells you how the probability flows over time, right? But it does not tell you how a point, like a vertex in your graph is gonna move explicitly over time because when you flow, even if you start at a point, you end up with a distribution with the master equation. There is an, another approach to the dynamics which is called the Langevin equation in the continuous setting, okay? In the continuous setting, there's something called the Langevin equation. It's a so-called stochastic differential equation. And I don't have really the technical expertise to go into that here, uh, but it's not an ordinary differential equation because there's noise built into it. And there is no exact analog of the Langevin equation in this theory of Markov chains. All you have, which kind of comes out of, uh, which is related to the Langevin setting, is writing down this stochastic process, that writing down what the probability density function is on the space of trajectories, right? So, so in a sense, you know, that's the best you can do. But in fact, in fact, in fact, uh, a stochastic differential equation, it just is, a probability distribution on the space of trajectories. Uh, is that entirely equivalent, or just does, does the latter follow from the former? Right. No, it's it's it, it's entirely equivalent. Okay. Because so, you, see, you see, when 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 people write down, you know, this stochastic equation, there right. is this noise term. Yes. Right. And you know what 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 what's not like usually you know in the math literature it's not said explicitly that this noise term means that there is like a distribution, a probability distribution of this noise term. Mm -hmm. And this probability distribution, first of all, it's Gaussian. Uh -huh. And second of all, uh, it's Markovian. Okay. It means that, you know, Gaussian means that, you know, all the all correlation functions, uh, like, like time correlation functions of noise can, can be written as some, some of products of two-point correlation functions. Yeah, and and uh, the the mark of nature 
says that this um, correlation function of noise at different times is actually a delta function. By the way, when, when, when physicists say correlation, they're usually referring to something like covariance in statistics, right? I, I, I should point out to my, uh, to, to my, to my students. Yeah. Right? Yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, if the last part of the, what we're talking about that makes no sense to you, it's okay. Uh, because uh, it, it's sort of a different topic in a way, but Vladimir is pointing out, and I think it's it, it, that that really uh, what this stochastic differential equations is all about is really writing down a probability distribution on trajectories, right? That's really what it is, okay, mm -hmm. if you like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so in that sense, we've actually moved between the Langevin approach and the master equation approach or the Kolmogorov approach, or if you like, we've moved between the Hamiltonian approach and the, Lange and the, and the Lagrangian approach, right? That's really what it is in, in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so uh, I have nothing more to say, except that uh, I hope to see more, uh, others this next week, and I'll, I'll release uh, probably an abstract with my next talk as well. I just have a question for us, Klein. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, next week, when you talk about uh, Kirchhoff's uh, topic, so will you be uh, talking about the KVL and KCL laws, or is that is going to be completely? Oh, oh, like the voltage laws and all yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll explain that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, in any case, uh, I, I thank you for coming. And again, like, I really kind of need you graduate students to ask questions, you know, if you can, right? So don't yeah. be afraid, okay? So uh, till next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm.